we like to start with something funny. And I heard about these three folks who were talking, a Russian, an American, and a blonde. I'm not looking up to see if there's any blondes in the area, but if you're next to one, pay attention now. They were talking one day, and the Russian proudly said, we were the first ones in space. Well, the American wouldn't be outdone. He said, well, we're the first ones on the moon. Well, she wouldn't be outdone, and she said, we're going to be the first one on the sun. That's what they did. They said, yeah, that's not going to work so well for you. You're going to burn up. Do you think about the logistics of that? She said, of course I did. We're going to go at night. <laughs> Celebrate a brown next to you. I'm just kidding. All right. Raise your Bible. Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. Lord, I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Lord, right now, give us receptive hearts. Help us to understand what you have for us. And um, forgive me with any blind people who are in the room. Amen. Amen. Well, look, I'm kind of blondish. All right, see. All right, so. Don't, don't play into that at all. Don't, don't speak now. Thank you. All right. Since we're in week number five, I'm just going to recap in the briefest way possible. Week number one, we talked about don't be lukewarm. Don't be sap when you can be mm, syrup. That was lukewarm. That was week number one. Be on fire for God. It takes heat of fire to make you from sap to syrup, something that is sweet and good and useful. Week number two was choose safety in the form of integrity. Choose safety by being a person of your word and being a person of integrity. That also engages us in accountability. Amen? And many of us are doing that with our cell phones. We're texting people. Paul just shared about it this morning. Hey, I text these young people. I, I let them know God loves you, has a purpose for you. Do that. Week number three, choose God's grace. That's huge. If you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior this morning, that is the first and foremost thing we'd like to share with you is that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago so that he can have a personal relationship with you and so that he can bridge the gap from you to God because we in our sin can't get there without him. Amen? Choose grace. And then once you choose grace for yourself, give grace. Anybody make a mistake around you this week and you're tempted to go, oh! <gasps> Take that and throw it out the window. Don't go, oh, go, oh, I love you. Come on, I got you. We're going to do this together. And you're not a failure. That doesn't define you. God defines you. And I'm here with you. And we're going to walk beside you. And we will not judge you. Because I don't like being judged. Choose a side was weak. Number four, last week, choose a side. Being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a McNugget. Amen. You got to choose a side when you come to church. Whose side am I on? And then use the weapons of warfare that God gives us. Ephesians chapter 6, if you want to refer back there. Today, though, we want to talk to you about trust God in prayer. Trusting God to do something in prayer that you haven't seen done yet. I want us to understand that in America, we think that we have a misunderstanding that somebody who looks like life is going well, we look at them and say, they're blessed. We just have that tendency to do that, right? Or we look at somebody who's they, they, they got their picture on Facebook and everything looks like it's all together. So we'd say, man, they're really progressing. They're doing well. Or when things are going like easy, things just seem to fall into place. We might say as Christians, oh, the Lord is in it. Everything is just falling into place. And I want to remind you of the cross this morning. It didn't look like Jesus had it all together when he went there, did it? 
It didn't look like anything was falling into place for him, was it? And it sure wasn't easy. The word excruciating has the central word built into it, crucify. The word excruciating came from Jesus' death on a cross. It was excruciating. The next time you say, I'm excruciatingly hungry, forget that thought. That's just foolish. Amen? You're not excruciatingly anything. Excruciating is what Jesus did and suffered. So the next time we think that going through a difficult place means, well, they got work to do. No, it means God's doing some work in you and I in the dark places. So a subtitle to today might be called Going Through the Dark Places. Going Through the Dark Places. Is there anyone in the place today who's had a hardship, even in the last two weeks, that you say, I've had a, I've had, I've had a significant hardship. Just raise your hand. I, we don't have a clue what it is. I don't want to know what it is. Amen. We've had a hardship. We've gone through a dark place. Maybe it's in your body. Maybe it's something that's physical and you're, you're wondering, why am I going through this? Why am I scheduled for radiation? Why are my finances not coming together? Why can't I get the job that I'd like? I think Perhaps it's because in the dark places is when the greatest thing happens. The greatest thing on earth happened in the darkest place ever when Jesus goes to the cross to bring light and to bring hope. In your dark place, what could be the reason God would allow us to go through a dark place? I think this is it. Because God wants us not to just go through it, but grow through it. Yes, you remember a few series ago, we talked about don't just go through it, but grow through this. You know, let's take the seed as an example. When a seed is sitting up on a shelf, remember our pumpkin seeds that we forgot to plant last year? Well, they didn't bloom on the shelf, did they? They remained seeds. We couldn't see what they would become because we forgot to plant them deep and put them in a dark place so that what was inside could come out and they could live to their full potential. They're still sitting on a shelf and they're still just seeds. But I I want to remind you, if you're still sitting on a shelf, so to speak, you haven't seen your full potential yet, it's still there. Amen? It's still there in you. It might take a dark place for some of us to find our talents, to see our dreams and goals and potentials come to life. It's going to come to life in a dark place. In the Bible, we find that there are so many who went through a dark place before they could be used greatly of God. I think all of us are like, Ah, don't use me greatly then, you know. (laughs) I don't want to go to the dark place. Amen? That's our first natural thought, right? I I don't want to go through a dark place for God to use me greatly. I'm going to remind you something harshly. You don't have a choice. You're going to go through dark places. You're either going to go through it as you grow through it, or you're going to get to keep going through it again and again and again and again and again like the Israelites until they die off and they are no more. Learn from it. Grow through it. Joseph is our finest example. Here's a guy that we, we know of biblically that we can't find anything he did wrong. We don't really know other than it seemed like he taunted his brothers a little bit. No big deal. I did that perfectly. I was good. at I was professional at being a little brother, all right? And, and, and they still love me. They don't hold that against me. Well, Ron might, but anyway, some of them don't. I love you guys. But that, that, that doesn't, that's not a prerequisite for like, oh, the other guys, they, he committed murder, he committed adultery, he committed this, he committed that. What did Joseph do? That he would get 13 years, he was put in a dark place by his family, put in a pit, that's a dark place, left there for dead. Well, oh, well let's sell them instead. Well, let's make money on it. This is a great idea. And all of this happens, for what reason could it be?
be to Joseph as he's going through his dark place. It had to make zero sense. I'm going to come back to your dark place right now. What sense does your dark place mean right now? How do you make sense of what you're going through physically? What is happening in that relationship? What is happening in your finances? What is happening in this dark place? How do you make sense of it? For Joseph, it wouldn't make sense until 13 years in as he's been faithful, 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 faithful. I encourage you to be faithful. And 13 years in, he is risen to second in command over the greatest nation at that time, Egypt. And for what purpose? It was to see his brothers come in who had sold him into slavery and look at them and love them and say, I'm your brother. Hey, remember the one you left for dead? Surprise! I could call guards right now and have you slain before me. And probably part of his selfish carnal nature, he'd like to have seen that done. But he was overcome with doing the right thing and honoring God. And he was positioned for such a place and time to be a blessing to his family. And then to allow this place in Goshen, just outside of Egypt, where all God's people would assemble together. And the Israelite people would be able to live in peace and have peace plenty. God took care of all of that because of one man going through a dark place and honoring God through it. You are one person going through a dark place. Will you honor God through it and see it through to the end and see what he will do? Later on, Moses, he goes to a dark place. He's put in the, 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 the basket and sent down the, the Nile River because Pharaoh said, kill all the kids under two because I'm, I'm scared. Somebody's going to ascend my throne and take this from me. So Moses goes down the river. He's grown up in this dark environment. And as he's coming to the light, God lets him know, you're going to, I want you to set my people free. He trips out and kills an Egyptian and then has to flee to Midian for 40 years. That's a dark place for a long time. Why did he go to the dark place? God had to teach him a lot about humility, about trust, about how to honor God and who he is. I want us to use the dark places in our lives as God then used Moses to set God's people free from Egyptian rule. And he had to have the audacity to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Let God's people go. And it was. On and on we see guys in the Bible, gals in the Bible, who did go through dark places. Samson with Delilah, David with Bathsheba, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, thrown in the fiery furnace, Daniel in the lion's den, Abraham and Lot, you name them, they went through dark places. But I want to remind us we're in good company today because we also go through this refining fire together of a dark place in our lives. If you're not in it right now, you were in it. And maybe you got to look back and go, I want to learn from what I went through, so I don't have to go through this again. Amen? And some of us need to look back at what we went through and say, oh, wow, thank you, Jesus. I, I learned so much from that. I want to be your man, your woman to shine so brightly and bring this hope to others. Also, when we go through some dark place, and if maybe you're going to go into one, well, you didn't need to hear that this morning. I wish you'd heard that from her and didn't like her for saying it. But you, you might be going in to a dark place. I don't know what God has in store for you. But when you come out of it and go through it, do you know that you complain much less about the parking place that wasn't available at church? Do you know what I mean? Because you just went through something huge. A parking spot didn't seem like a big deal. You'll complain less about the fact that it's snowing in April in New York State. It won't really matter. Because you went through some dark stuff that's darker than that. You're not going to worry about that coworker that treated you poorly. Because you see a big picture. 
instead of the small nitpicky things the world worries about. So, if you're building a skyscraper that God wants to build in you, you've got to go deep and build a foundation that is deep to take that building higher. Amen? So can we look at our dark places as, all right, God, take me deep, anchor me deep, that I can be firm and steady and ready for all that comes my way. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, and that sums up being in a dark place. Man, when in a dark place, you don't know what's going on. You, don't, you can't see in a dark place. And you don't know where to turn, and you don't know where to run, and you don't know what to do. If you lack wisdom, you should ask God. What is that? That's war room. That, this is prayer. This is taking it to God and letting him do with your dark place what he must do. Who gives generously to all without finding fault. Amen. Woo! He doesn't find fault when you come. Can somebody say, Woo! He does not find fault when you come and ask for wisdom. It will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man or woman should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man or woman, unstable in all he or she does. It's a lot easier when things are going great, right? We can pray for something and we feel real good about it because things are going great. But in those dark places, it's hard to know exactly what God's doing. It's hard to see trusting him. Can we still trust him? Yes, we can. And that scripture that says we can here, it says in verse 6, look at when we ask, when we go to God in prayer, it says you must believe and not doubt. You must believe and not doubt. Literally, that means you must have faith. What does that mean? Well, I always thought that it meant, well, if it says I have to have faith, then I will choose to have faith. I will have this. I will have it myself. I will make it up myself. I don't know what it is or how to have it, but I will choose it and I will do it. That's just kind of what I thought. Faith and belief, I, I meshed them together. But in Scripture, belief is different than faith. Belief is a foundation. The Bible says that we believe and we need to choose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and believe that he died on a cross for our sins and ask him to be our Savior and we will be forgiven. We need to believe that foundational truth and that is right. And once we believe that and we can move forward in that belief, when we go through a dark time, then God gives us faith. Listen to what I just said. Faith always comes from God. It's not something we can conjure up within ourselves. You know, I felt guilty in times past when, when I prayed and prayed and prayed for something, and then it didn't happen the way I had prayed. You know, I prayed for somebody, I, and I thought I had faith. I conjured up that faith, and, you know, I thought I was doing it right, and then they passed away, and that didn't make sense to me because what there must have been something wrong with my faith, and I felt guilty. That's not the way it is. That's not the way God wants us to live with, with guilt and feeling like we're responsible because we didn't have enough. God gives us faith when we're crying out to him. He's the one we're dependent on him for our faith. But there's a prerequisite to receiving that faith. Faith is God's work. Faith is never the work of people. We cannot produce it ourselves. It is his revelation. Therefore, it's greater and beyond belief. Belief is the foundation. In order to have our faith grow in the dark places, then we need to know the one. Here's the prerequisite. We need to know the one who gives the faith. We need to know who he is. And you're not going to know somebody unless you spend time with them, right? I mean, you might have some acquaintances here at church that you see, you know, once a week, and you'd be like, yep, I think I remember their name. I'm not sure. But you don't, even if you remember their name, you don't really know them unless you take time to have a conversation with them, right? It's the same way with God. We can't know him until we read his word and learn who he is, until we spend time with him in prayer and not just talking to him, but spend time listening to him. And then we can know him and understand him. 
Not that we ever fully understand him because he's God. <laughs> Don't take that wrong. But we can have faith and peace because he gives that to us in the midst of the dark places. Notice that it says there that if we don't have this faith, that if we don't have that foundation, if we haven't spent time with him, if we haven't learned who he is, spent time creating a relationship there with God, then we become something when we don't have faith. We become like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. We become double-minded and we're unstable in all that we do. Now, don't picture nice, relaxing, peaceful, gentle waves here. That's not what it means in the original language. It means hurricane winds that are tossing the waves and these awful waves that are just making you sick to your stomach, choppy, rough, billowing, surging, out of control. Anybody like that? Not, no, that's scary. It makes us feel sick to our stomach, right? And, and scared out of your mind waves. That's what that means. You don't know which way you're going. That's what it's like when we go through a dark place and we have not fostered a relationship with God. And then we go through a dark place and we feel sick to our stomach and scared out of our mind because we can't see which direction the wind is even coming from. And that's because we don't know the one who wants to give us faith in that moment. We must take time to get to know him on a daily basis. Really find out who he is. Where it says double-minded there and unstable. Do you want to be unstable? No. Nobody chooses to be unstable. We don't, we don't say, that's what I want in my life. I want to be unstable. No. We don't want that. We want stability. We want to feel confident. But you can't when you don't know Jesus and you don't know the faith that he wants to give you. He wants to fill us with strength. And so double-minded, when it says that, double-minded, that is an interesting word. It's a phrase that was first used right in the Bible. And they can't find it in any other Greek wording before the Bible. So they feel that it is originated right here in this particular verse. And it really literally means split in half. Someone who is indecisive, like a spiritual schizophrenic. We can picture that, right? A spiritual schizophrenic. One who runs to God. Oh, Lord, please help, help, help. This is really bad. I need your help. I need your help. And then you get through the dark time, and then you really don't have time for him. You know, we're, we're over here, and we don't need God anymore because things are going well, and I'm strong, and I'm capable, and I can do it myself until a dark place comes. Oh, God, please help, help, help. I need your help. And then, he, and then you get through the dark place, and we don't really need God anymore. That's spiritual schizophrenia. That doesn't sound fun either. There's no stability there. So when the dark time comes, we're lost. We're out of control. We feel sick to our stomach. We want to give up. We don't know what faith is. And God is saying, I want to help you. I want to give you faith. Cry out to me. Get to know me. I love you. If you choose to live with spiritual schizophrenia back and forth, then you'll not be given the gift of faith in the moments that you need it the most. 1 John 4, nope, 1 John 5, chapter 4, verse 4. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Ready? Here it is, the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. That's the victory that's overcome the world, and we get that from who? Jesus Jesus overcame when he died on a cross. He wants to give us that victory. He wants to impart in us faith, but you can't have faith if you don't know him. And you can't have faith if you don't know who God really is. And so that's the key. Spending time with him, trusting him in prayer means I got to spend time with him daily. I need to know and hear his voice, read his word, talk to him. And listen to him. Know God, who God really is. And you can't know him if you don't develop and work on that relationship with him. Then you can say with confidence, greater is he living in me than he who is in the world. There's a song I remember uh, when we traveled and sang. It goes like this. 
really reaffirms the, even the faith comes from God. Even my praise comes from God. And it goes like this. Even the praise comes from you. Every prayer that I raise comes from you. Fill my mouth with words of worship, and I'll give them back to you. But it takes us getting alone with God and coming to Him and hear from Him. And in the midst of that dark place, God wants to take us to some place we've never been. Not restore you to the same old. He wants something new. Behold, I make all things new. Lord Jesus, we stand up and we say, please, I can't make Robbie ready. I can't make somebody else ready. I can't make my sons ready. God, you need to make me ready. I only can make account for me. Raise me up to more than I can be in Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd raise me up on my knees this week. Help me to be attentive to your cry, to the warfare that's happening is spiritual. And I pray, Lord, that we're going to step on some, some habits that have led us by the nose. We would step on them under our feet in Jesus' name and not be led anymore by the flesh. If we live by the flesh, we cannot please God. That's my devotions this morning. Lord, may we not be led by what we feel and this fleshly desire to please me. It leads to the death. It leads to evil. Lord, I pray that we would be your men and women of integrity, of power, of authenticity. And as we head into next week's event, we would be prayed up, that we would attend. We will be early. We will help out. We will be attentive and we will be your hands, your feet, your mouth of encouragement, your blessing, your smile, your joy, your depth. Help us, oh God, because this is the time. Thank you for these people that I call my friends and my family. Bless them this week and until everlasting in Jesus' name. Amen.